But the good news was, and this is the thing that, <sighs> this is the thing I hate. Whenever anyone asks me, well, how do we, you know, how do you break in? How do you, you know, how do you get an agent? How do you do all these things? And I never know what to say because we just got completely lucky. This is screenwriter Parker Bennett talking about breaking into the industry. But before that happened, Parker, along with his writing partner, Terry Runte, had a few stops along the way. So we were working in advertising and writing for uh, National Lampoon and Playboy and Omni magazine, which used to be a thing, and um, doing things like that. But we were still at the same time, you know, really trying to figure out the screenwriting thing. And they do figure out the screenwriting thing. And so we worked up a thing, kind of a mashup of After Hours and, I don't know, Gross Point Blank. I, I don't know if that was even out yet. Better Off Dead. It was a very dark teen comedy about a guy who's set up on a date by his older brother. and But he's really being set up by the older brother who's not actually in law school. He's a sociopath who set him up to die in his place because he's in trouble with this Chinese mob gang. And through some of that luck that Parker was referring to, the two of them are able to land an agent. And eventually, a screenplay they write gets picked up by Dennis Quaid's production company and will be produced by Orion Pictures. And then for two and a half years, we struggled to try to get Orion to like tell us what they wanted. Because we kept asking, well, is it like, is this is too dark? Do we need to, you know, do we can't make it this dark? And she said, no, 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 if you can make it work. And it was like, that's not a note. So we kept trying. And ultimately, we, our very dark comedy got very watered down in trying to get it made because they didn't want to make it that dark. So the psychopathic, sociopathic older brother became just a, it's like a, a wacky misunderstanding where, where the younger brother takes the car, you know, not telling the older brother. So it wasn't all on purpose. And then he winds up in the middle of this this thing where he's supposed to be mistaken for his older brother and uh, gets slapped and shot at and all these things and still trying to make the date go well. The watered down version of their dark comedy is ultimately what got made. And on August 16th, 1991, their movie, which starred Ethan Hawke, Terry Polo and Fisher Stevens, called Mystery Date, was released. It's the date of his dreams, and Tom McHugh really wants to put his best foot forward. Um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Unfortunately, tonight, Tom's got two left feet, too many women, and too many enemies. Oh, hell's breaking this one. Uh... Mystery date. The first date is the worst date. Tom, I'm up into your face. Sneak preview Sunday, August 11th, rated PG-13. And Mystery Date died a quick box office death. And while they were writing and rewriting it, they had ignored a number of other things. Other jobs their agent had given them. Rewrite jobs went by the wayside because Mystery Date had been their priority. After all, it had been greenlit into production, and they got paid a lot of money for it. Terry would joke that basically our heads were so big when we sold Mystery Day because it was like, you know, it was a quarter of a million dollar deal. So we were all like, oh, my God, it's a quarter of a millionaires. And then we'd have to go, well, no, no, because we're we have to split it. So we're like qu half of a quarter of a million. No, then we have to give 10 percent to the agent and 5 percent to the lawyer. We have to pay taxes. And so we're like. And then we have to rewrite it. And then that went on for two and a half years. And Terry joked that by the time we were done, we made less than a Taco Bell manager salary. <laughs> like we made less than a Taco Bell manager makes writing this movie for Hollywood. And ignoring those rewrite jobs hurt them in the long run. But it's not over for Parker and Terry. Things were kind of sputtering after Mystery Day came out. And our agent sort of had basically fawned us off on another junior agent, a former assistant of his. And it was not looking good because the former assistant was also the guy who had been handling the phone calls from our pissed off producers while we were, you know, ignoring the rewrite projects and working on Mystery Day. So he was a little dubious of us. But then he said, oh, you guys should come out here, right? And take, we'll do a trip. We'll do some meetings. You guys have that pitch you had to do, you know, you had a pitch idea. And I don't think we actually had a pitch idea, but we said, all right, let's come out. And he said, oh, and I think we can get you a meeting on Super Mario Brothers. And we're like, how are they going to make a movie on Super Mario Brothers? My name is Dan Delgado, and in this episode, 
we're taking a look at the answer to that question. How did they make a movie out of Super Mario Brothers? Welcome to the industry. Roland Jaffe is a critically acclaimed and Oscar-nominated director whose work in the 1980s include The Killing Fields, a true story about dictator Pol Pot's ethnic cleansing in Cambodia, and The Mission, a period drama about an 18th century Jesuit priest who journeys to South America and starts a mission only to see it come in conflict with the Portuguese government who want to use the natives for slavery. Neither picture would be in the category of feel-good or summer fun. But somehow, this guy, Roland Jaffe, who makes very serious pictures, wound up being the guy who wanted to take the Nintendo video game Super Mario Brothers and turn it into a movie. Super Mario Brothers shouldn't have existed, period. Like, like it's it's very strange project because it was Roland Jaffe, who was the director of The Killing Fields and The Mission, and he joined forces with another producer that he'd worked with a lot named Jake Eberts, who had founded Goldcrest Films and had won, you know, uh, Oscars for Chariots of Fire and Gandhi. And so, like, these guys somehow decided they wanted to make Super Mario Brothers. And they convinced the head of, of Nintendo. They, like, talked him into this. Like, oh, we see this great thing that's not necessarily... They, they didn't want it tied to the video game that much. So they were kind of making him feel better, like, well, the video game will be the video game. And this will be a separate thing that's just, you know, that's separate from the video game. Turning a video game into a movie is almost a normal thing these days. For example, in 2021, there were three video game movies. Back in the early 1990s, there were none. Super Mario Brothers was going to be the first. Roland Jaffe had a new production company called Light Motive that was going to produce it, and they hired Barry Morrow, who had won an Oscar for co-writing Rain Man to come up with the script. So they hired Barry Morrow, who was one of the writers on Rain Man, they paid him a million dollars and they got him to write this existential road trip movie about this kind of grumpy, cynical older brother who's kind of a con man and his sort of idiot savant younger brother. And it was so much like Rain Man. It was as if like they joked about it in the office. It was like he, he did search and replace on the script for Rain Man and put Mario and Luigi in it. And then they, so the office joke was it was, they called it Drain Man, and that was not going to work. But, but it did what they wanted, which was make the project serious because they spent money on a big writer, an A-list writer, and they got splashed all over the trades that they had hired Barry Morrow and they, you know, made this big deal. So Parker and Terry weren't the first screenwriters to work on Super Mario Brothers. They weren't even the second. Director Tom Beeman had been previously hired along with the screenwriting team of Jim Genoan and Tom Parker, maybe best known for writing the Flintstones live-action picture from 1994. They wrote what you would expect, which was a, it's a fantasy world, it's brightly colored, it's Koopa's kind of a lizard creature, and there's mushroom tribe, and there's a princess, and there's talking rocks. And when we came into the office, you know, there's like these giant big blocks of clay that are sculpted with faces and, and are, you know, mouths. So they were mac maquettes of these creature designs and there were storyboards. And they did some focus groups and it was like a movie for five-year-olds. It wasn't going to be a big hit because it was skewing so young that it would be a kid's, it would just be a kid's movie. But skewing that young was not where the producers wanted to go with this. So in comes the husband and wife directing team of Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jenkel to take over the project. And maybe this is a good time to mention that Rocky and Annabelle did not respond to my request for an interview. But at this point in their careers, Rocky and Annabelle had one feature under their belt, the 1988 remake of DOA with Dennis Quaid. But maybe more significantly was that they had helped create the character of Max Headroom and had directed the TV movie featuring Headroom as well, and had also done a number of music videos and commercials. Because they came from the world of commercials and music videos, they were just really good with ideas. And they could come up with idea after idea after idea. And they, were, they were really genuinely talented and, and imaginative. And the problem they had is that they were used to working in 30-second increments or 60-second increments or music videos, like, you know, three, four-minute increments. 
and they'd done one movie, but they weren't as experienced with like trying to structure a story that would pull you through, you know, an hour and a half to two hour movie. And eventually directors Rocky and Annabelle bring in writers Parker and Terry. They told us our, their idea. And it was this, basically, it was like a, something out of the MCU now. It was like the multiverse. So there was this, you know, the dinosaurs didn't go extinct. There was a giant meteor that hit the Earth and it split the dimensions. And the dinosaurs were thrust into this parallel dimension where they continued to evolve until they looked sort of like us, more or less. And they're really aggressive and reptilian, cold-blooded. And so Koopa is this reptilian ancestor of the dinosaurs. And I just thought this was brilliant. I was like, this is the most genius idea ever because I could finally see a movie. And the meeting goes well. They have a great conversation with Rocky and Annabelle and their agent calls them up and lets them know, hey, guys, you didn't get it. They apparently didn't pitch enough plot, so they were passed over. But Parker still has an idea. And so Terry and I wrote up this seven-page treatment of like, hey, we didn't get a chance to tell you all of our cool ideas for the story. So here, here are our cool ideas for the story. And we mapped out three acts, and we talked about the characters. And I took my Mac, my ancient now Mac SE30, and I used Super Paint to make this bitmap cover, like poster. So I drew a poster that was this, a maze of old pipes going into the darkness. And in the very end, there's like a darkened tunnel and there's a pair of glowing eyes in the very end of the tunnel. And it says, unclogging the world this summer, Super Mario Brothers. And so we sent this off and our agent called and said, you got it. And we came out and met with them. And that's when we saw all of this work that had been done before they had come on board. And we also learned that basically they didn't care what we wrote in the seven pages. They really liked the poster. Now they have the job and a script to write. And so the issue is, how do you approach this? How do you approach adapting a video game to the big screen? We really thought, okay, Super Mario Brothers, this is a cool concept. We could make this into Ghostbusters. We could make this funny and quirky and the monsters are, you know, uh, kind of fun monsters and so we really had this Ghostbusters template in our head. And for the next six weeks, Rocky and Annabelle and Parker and Terry are all working together to try to figure this out. How to make Super Mario Brothers work as a movie. But six weeks and many ideas later, not a lot of progress had been made. And finally, Terry and I realized we were never going to get a draft done this way and we had to go disappear and just make some decisions and write the movie the best we could. This was problematic because once they were away, the ideas that they developed were no longer interesting to Rocky and Annabelle. Now that was a problem, and it wasn't the only one. A couple other things were going on that that were also hard for us, which was the producers had spent all this money and they were really eager for us to spend as much time not in the parallel dino world as possible because they knew that would be super expensive. So we kept kind of expanding the first act of this, you know, Brooklyn stuff, which wasn't germane really to the movie. It was like, okay, there's some people who are kidnapped. There's there's women who are kidnapped because the people on the other side can't tell humans apart. So they're trying to get Princess Daisy and so they kidnap all these Brooklyn girls. And Mario and Luigi have this altercation with this rival plumber and so we kept expanding this idea and daisy and luigi were going to have a romance and and we had this very long first act and then there was the issue of who was going to play mario this was going to end up dictating how the script would go and parker and terry had a different idea casting wise and so in our minds he was bill murray he was you know we actually thought bruno kirby would be a good mario and he, oh, Bruno Kirby would have been a great Mario. Oh my God. Yes. He would have been, you know, young, he and Luigi would have been about the same age. You know, he'd be the older brother, but he would be kind of a, you know, he was more like that draft, like from the very first, you know, he was a little more of a scammer hitting on women. And he was like all these things that would not work at all once they hired Bob Hoskins. And they hired Bob Hoskins just as we finished our first draft. In addition to Bob Hoskins, also getting cast were Samantha Mathis as Princess Daisy, Dennis Hopper as King Koopa, and an interesting choice in John Leguizamo as Luigi, Mario's brother. Interesting because 
Not only does Leguizamo look nothing like his video game counterpart, he's also 22 years younger than Bob Hoskins, his on-screen brother. So with casting set, they have to change the script to better suit Bob Hoskins. And then once that's done... Fred Caruso, one of the really great line producers, he uh, worked on the Godfather movies. Nice guy, and he came in and was just as nice as humanly possible, said, just hypothetically, uh, if you had to be out of this office, how long would that take? <laughs> and uh, just if you had to get packed up and out of here, like, is that a day? Is that two days? <laughs> Uh, so he fired us in a very nice way, and we thought we were done. Parker and Terry head to Chicago. Meanwhile, back in L.A., a series of screenwriters cycle through the Super Mario production. Dick Clement and Ian LaFournay, a couple of British sitcom writers who also wrote The Commitments, are up next. They do a draft, then they're out, and in is George Stone, a writer on Max Headroom. He's in, and then he's out, and while the writing carousel continues... Pre-production is already starting based on the work that Parker and Terry had already done. Koopa and Yoshi and the city of Dino Hatton are already starting. Light Motive had locked themselves into a commitment for Memorial Day 1993. And script or no script, that day was coming. Eventually, it's screenwriters Ed Solomon and Ryan Rowe that finished the shooting script. And as the production goes on, Parker and Terry are still in touch with an assistant on the movie. And they get talked into driving down to the set in North Carolina to visit. And so we showed up on set, and Rocky Morton comes out, and he's very jovial. He's very British. He said, oh, good. I was just hoping I could get a couple of pencils here. And so we were the pencils to him. Like, we would, like, listen to what he wanted to do and, and make the script changes. And the producers were like, oh, good. We're $25 million over budget. We need to cut anything we haven't filmed. We need to cut pages out of <laughs> So that's really why we were there. And they hired us to stay on for a couple of weeks. And so we slashed and cut things that hadn't been shot. And we tried to, you know, combine ideas so that it came through. Basically, they've been rehired and remained with the shoot to rewrite whatever is needed, which apparently was a lot. And the shoot was not exactly fun. So they were shooting in this abandoned cement factory and none of the sound was usable. So it was a disaster. It was 110 degrees. The actors were all miserable. Uh, it was a notoriously awful production. And everyone was just trying to get through it. And the sound was not great. I guess some of it was usable. But they did, apparently, according to the post-production supervisor, the most ADR looping of any movie she'd ever experienced. The miserable shoot kept on with Parker and Terry there for most of it as the on-set writers or rewriters. And while there, Parker saw a lot of problems. They continually were penny-wise and pound-foolish. Chris Woods was the special effects uh, coordinator, and they tasked him with basically creating an in-house special effects company. So he hired a, a whole bunch of people in-house to do these special effects instead of going out to ILM. And so we got, you know, okay effects, but meanwhile, ILM was making... Jurassic Park. So so if they, you know, maybe spent the money hiring the people who know what they're doing or know already know, you know, easily how to do things. You know, they had the budget and they created a couple of cool CGI shots, but that was, you know, it was still in its infancy and they're not great and they look a little like, you know, they're not as good as, you know, video games from from 2002. <laughs> and yeah, so that's a problem. Issues with special effects are one thing, but issues with basic comfort is another. They could build the entire street of the big street set on, and they could have a bunch of other, you know, they could do a lot of other things, but they could, you know, they couldn't air condition the space. So it was just awful. And don't think that Parker and Terry didn't have their own problems on this set. We had rewritten some scene of Dennis Hopper's uh, to cut out a few words, and he th like he exploded uh, because he had, you know, he had taken the time and the brain cells to memorize the scene that was there before. And we'd cut like, you know, four sentences out of it or something to try to, you know, save us some time. And, and we got this call on set to, to come, you know, the producers like immediately come, come right now, the, uh, the makeup place. And so we were the, where the makeup 
was going on. And Dennis Hopper, they, the producers and the director basically kind of shoved us at Dennis Hopper for him to yell at us. Like they threw us under the bus and he hollered at us for literally at least 20 minutes. And he made me, he made somebody like go get a dictionary and he made me look up the word act and read out the definition out loud. He was very unhappy. I think the whole day was lost because of this tirade. And I think so the, the four sentences we tried to cut to save money cost the whole day. And it just sort of goes on and on until production eventually wraps. And it was kind of apparent the more we hung out but watching the footage coming in. It was like, oh, no. <laughs> this well, there was it like some of it looked OK. Like it looked good. Like they were they were stylish directors, but it was like not making sense. And and it was not cutting together easily and so and it was and the directors had sort of a frenetic video music video sensibility and i'll just jump ahead you know eventually the production wrapped up the directors as far as i know they were kind of asked to leave at the very end and the second direct second unit director took over finishing up the last shots that were there i should point out that parker is not 100 percent on their firing you don't don't hold me to that. I'm not sure exactly what happened. They might have they might have gotten fed up and left for all I know. Either way, Super Mario Brothers is finished and released on its originally intended day of Memorial Day, 1993. From Hollywood Pictures. <laughs> you must be the great Koopa. He controlled half the universe. Guy in charge. But he wanted more. Get me the rock. Come and get it, lizard breath. Now, two plumbers from Brooklyn <laughs> must find the power to stop him. I'll kill that. Super Mario Brothers, rated PG parental guidance suggested, starts Friday, May 28th at a theater near you. And well, this is not going to be a surprise, but it does not do very well. It opens up in fourth place with eight and a half million dollars. Ahead of it were the Sylvester Stallone thriller Cliffhanger, the Whoopi Goldberg Ted Danson comedy Made in America. Both of those were in their first weekend. And third place was Dave, the feel-good political comedy, which was in its third week. Overall, it took in about $20 million domestically and about $18 million internationally. And since it cost somewhere around $45 million to make, well, that's not very good math. Yes, it was a flop. But it wasn't some giant Heaven's Gate-esque flop that shook the world. Fortunately for Super Mario Brothers, that honor went to a different movie that summer the Arnold Schwarzenegger vehicle, Last Action Hero. Super Mario Brothers was, you know, it was early in the summer and it just kind of got forgotten. So it certainly didn't help our career, but it, but we felt like we could recover from it. And uh, that turned out to be optimistic. <laughs> we, were, we were pretty hard to hire after Super Mario Brothers came out and didn't do any business. And so Terry and I went back to writing uh, spec scripts for, you know, that we wanted to do. And just like a lot of other 1990s summer movie flops, it just sort of faded away. It was released on home video and then on DVD, but there's no official Blu-ray released in the United States. And that's kind of impressive considering it was released by Hollywood Pictures, which is a now defunct division of Disney. Super Mario Brothers, just like any other forgotten movie, would show up on TV from time to time and would occasionally be brought up as an example of why video games shouldn't be made into movies. Years later, Bob Hoskins famously called it the worst movie he ever made and said the production was a nightmare. So it was just another summer flop, and that's about it. Until these guys came around. Ryan Haas, that's Joe S.S. Yeah, and Stephen Applebaum. And Super Mario Brothers wasn't really much of a thing for Ryan growing up. He was about five when the movie came out, and like a lot of people, he didn't see it then. I, I kind of knew about the games, and I remember the film coming out on VHS, and I remember my parents renting it and not letting me watch it. I remember them renting it and thinking like, oh, this is too intense for you, Bola. And then years later, probably it had to be like fourth grade, fifth grade, something like that. I remember it was on TV, and I asked my dad, what is that? 
what is this movie? And it was like early on, it was in the Brooklyn scenes. So I was like, what is this? And my dad was like, oh, this is the Super Mario Brothers movie. And I'm like, really? And I was intrigued with it. It was right before I was leaving to go to a friend's house to, for, for the night to sleep over, like for over a weekend or something. And we went to the video store then and rented it then. And that's when I watched it. And then I was completely like blown away. And while most people had the experience of knowing the video game first and then watching the movie, which does not resemble it very well, for Ryan, it was kind of the opposite. So I saw the movie before I really got into the games, and then it had this reverse effect of like, well, now I gotta play the games, and now, okay, the games aren't like the movie, and now I have to figure out like where the connection is and why do this, what, you know, why? <laughs> like, so that, that's how I kind of got into the, the, the movie. And not long after Ryan is blown away by the cinematic versions of Mario and Luigi, a website comes along that's going to push his fandom even further. I think we joined eBay, or I like me, my family joined eBay in 2000. And the very first item I ever bought on eBay was the Super Mario Brothers movie soundtrack. And that started a thing of, of like, oh, I can buy stuff on eBay. I just started searching for as many Super Mario Brothers movie things that there are. And that was hard to parse at the time because it was like, you would just get game stuff. And soon Ryan is buying anything he can that is associated with Super Mario Brothers. DVDs, action figures, party supplies, whatever. Didn't matter what it was, he was gonna buy it. And he went on collecting more and more, even getting his hands on things like storyboards from the production design. He started to notice that the online opinion of Super Mario Brothers was vastly different from his own. Most of the mentions of it were either flat out negative or that it was even one of the worst movies ever made. And then by that point in the like the mid 2000s, there were a lot of good Super Mario Brothers games websites like the Mushroom Kingdom and stuff. But then they would have like a page maybe that devoted to the movie, but it was nothing more than just like, oh, there was a movie. Like here's when it came out. Here's how much money it made. And here's like a couple of things about it. So I felt like there was a need for it. I had all the stuff and I felt like, well, I, this movie is really misunderstood. So I took it upon myself then to like, I'm just going to make a website just to catalog all this stuff and put it all out there and kind of advocate for the movie. So that's when I just made the website and then made a forum to go along with it so people could experience it and talk about it. And the goal was to like foster like a fan community. And that's exactly what happened. A Super Mario fan community sprung up through the forums about the shared love of an underappreciated movie. And that's when Steven enters the picture. He too had love of the movie since childhood. So my mom, knowing that I was into the games, she caught that it was on TV, recorded it on VHS, and she's like, here you go. So I would just watch it off that VHS recording all the time. and. I didn't really question that it wasn't Mario. I had a slight inkling that, you know, this isn't exactly what the games get across. This isn't the aesthetic I'm familiar with, but it, it didn't bother me. And, and I think a big part of that is because I was younger. I didn't grow up with the original games per se. So my impression was completely different. It was a fresh slate. Well, I had sort of forgotten the film for a long time and right out of high school, uh, 18 or 19 or so, I, I was revisiting it, like it just came to mind. And like Ryan said for himself, I, I was very curious about what that through line was between the games and the film, how it was adapted, why they made those decisions. Both Ryan and Steven saw this movie without the game looming over their expectations. So they saw it in a different way than most theater goers did in 1993. When you look at the film, you. You see how Daisy, even though the film is ostensibly about Mario and Luigi the Rescuers, for me, it, it really makes far more sense when you realize that Daisy is that main character and it's her journey as the sort of Persephone character who falls into the underworld and then realizes who she is. And Mario and Luigi, they're just there along for the ride. They're, they're like... Um, Mad Max and Fury Road. You think they're the protagonist, but really it's Furiosa. So just from an adaptational standpoint, for 1992, 1993, 
they were like really shooting on all cylinders, like trying to figure out how to adapt this game and give the due to all the characters and making sure the princess wasn't just a damsel, they weren't just two dimensional carbon copies of the game characters. And when Steven starts showing up on the forums, things start to happen. Steven got us our first interview with the actor when that's when we first did our interview with Mojo Nixon and then things just went just nuts from there where it was like, okay, this is a full blown like not just the merchandise. We're gonna like track down like everybody we can to get the full story about the movie and showcase people's work and get the full story out there. And since that first interview in 2010, they've gone on to interview a good portion of the cast and crew. But then they stumbled onto something else. Stephen was trying to find like, can we contact Light Motive and see if they have stuff, you know, from the film? Cause we want it. Like if they're not gonna do anything with it, can we like, you know, archive it? Cause that's what we want to do. But then they were like, oh, you're too late. We just liquidated everything. Like, we're everything's gone, whatever. And so we thought, well, damn, like, there's our only chance for, like, somebody that might have something because other other than light motive, like, Disney would just have whatever, like, in the vault. And Disney's super hard to deal with. You know, they, they won't even release the movie in the United States. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's bad with them. So, miraculously, this VHS tape just popped up on eBay a couple years ago and it was very mysterious and the only thing the label said was Super Mario Brothers like cut footage and we're like what you know and and we were trying to get it and then somebody bid on it and got it and we were like oh my god our only link is gone for this thing but it turned out to be the person that bought it was like a fan of us and a fan of the website he's like I wanted to get this to make sure you guys are the ones that got it which is which is amazing. But as it turns out, this mysterious VHS cassette was more than just a few cut scenes. We were like, well, what is this cut footage? I were like, best case scenario, it's just a, a reel of a bunch of the deleted scenes, cut footage. That was, that's what would make sense. But it turned out to be a complete cut of the film from December 92 with temp score and all that stuff. And so it turned out to be a, a early work print that cut of the film that was like 25 whatever minutes longer so that's basically what happened and then we you know the story goes on from there of of us uh, working with uh, Garrett Gilchrist to restore it into some sort of releasable version. Garrett Gilchrist is a filmmaker who also does film restoration. He's best known for doing the recobbled cut of the thief and the cobbler or the princess and the cobbler depending on whichever version you're watching. But he's very well known in the independent restoration animation community. He does excellent work, very passionate about what he does, spends a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. So he was literally working frame by frame, restoring the work print, trying to get as much color and quality and shading and shadows and everything out of it. It was a tremendous effort on his part. Yeah. It was just something we had to be patient with. And, you know, we've been patient for years. And several years after winning this work print in an eBay auction, they were able to release it online, calling it the Morton Jenkel Cut. And for free. If you want to watch it, you can. It's on their website, smbmovie.com, and it's also on archive.org. And what was the reaction to the new cut of this quote-unquote bad movie? The reaction was nuts generally on the film's anniversaries um the big ones there's a lot of articles like oh yeah the mario brothers movie like let's remember that and this was released this on around the anniversary this time to capitalize on that too and um there was a ton of coverage it made like ign like ig even reviewed it you know as a film (laughs) so it feels like largely because we had built it up and everything i think it was really positive i mean it was positive to, and even the even the negative stuff that I that I think I've seen was more like if you already hate the movie, you're gonna still it's still the same movie, it's just more of it. Like if you hate it, you're still gonna hate it. But if you liked it, give this a shot. And if you've never seen it, give this a shot. Like yeah, so it was really positive. Now you go ahead and take something from Disney and toss it out onto the internet for free, and you should expect to get some lawyers blowing up your phone. Disney has not exactly been shy about being litigious over things like this. So what's been the word from them or anyone else? 
Nothing at all from anything from the second I made the website in 2007 have I ever had any any legal like in fact the production people are like they love us like like light motive and stuff in particular and pathé like that that really controls the rights and I think part of it is because like Disney just doesn't care like they don't want to release it here so they don't care in 2021 not only did we get this new version of Super Mario Brothers, but a new Australian Blu-ray was released as well. And Ryan and Steven have even more plans to keep this movie alive. I'd say at this point, the big, big project we've been trying to put together is an art book. Uh, yes. I think we've made some good progress with that. I believe we have the right slot down. I mean, I'm not going to go into any detail, but we should have the right slot down to produce an art book and... It's just a matter of compiling everything we have. Mm -hmm. And that would be, you know, the dream come true. Yeah. Just having something to set down. It's an art on, coffee table book, like plunk. Yeah. Let's look, what, look at it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ryan's simple website and fan forum have turned into something else, something bigger. Almost like a museum for the film that will just keep expanding. And it's just been like a continuing, ongoing, feels like it should shouldn't and probably won't ever end like project about being like the internet's best and only, you know, website dedicated to this now historic event of the first video game to movie adaptation. And I had to ask Parker Bennett, who was also interviewed on the Super Mario Brothers archive site, what he thought of this new version. They did an amazing job just tracking down all the elements and finding things and getting it color graded and putting all these things back. And I have not watched it because I saw all that stuff sitting in, in Mark Goldblatt's trailer and watched him cut it all out because the movie was running two hours and 40 minutes. So there's a, you know, there's, it's interesting. It's definitely, you know, if you're a fan of the movie, it's interesting to see deleted scenes, but usually they're more interesting to see as deleted scenes and not as part of like trying to make, put them back in the movie necessarily. I don't know. I haven't, I can't really comment because I haven't watched the thing through. I will at some point. There, w there was a lot of promise. There was a lot of like backstory and things that kind of were never properly followed through on in the movie. And these guys have sort of picked up on and, you know, are looking for the clues about, and, and there were whole swaths of ideas that were really interesting that just, they couldn't do. They didn't have the budget anymore. After Super Mario Brothers, Parker and Terry wrote another script, but it didn't get any traction. So the two started to work on separate projects. And that's when tragedy struck. Terry Runte was in Jamaica researching a script idea when he was murdered in a robbery. He was 34. And yes, there's all kinds of specifics on what happened to him, but I don't want to turn this into a true crime story. The important detail here is that the person responsible for this was eventually found and caught. It was really hard to recover from. It was just like, Terry was my best friend. He was, he, he, when you have a good partnership with someone as a screenwriter, there's a downside to the upside. So the upside is, oh, I filled in what he was weak at. And he filled in the things that I was weak at. And so, you know, he didn't really wasn't that interested in structure or, you know, making things 120 pages. And I was like, you know, Mr. Anal Retentive. And the, you know, I was going to make sure that things were tight and the structure worked. And I, you know, I was funny too, but he, he would go off on these flights of, you know, like, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, like he would just be off the wall in ways that I could never really be. And so when you have an, an established partnership like that, it really, you become less sure of like, well, what is, you know, what do I write? What is my, like, can I, can I do the complete package here? And I got really discouraged over time. And ultimately, um, I just pivoted. Parker moved on to a number of other things, including developing websites for movies for a while. And he's still writing, though. And recently, he started his own online archive for his writing partner, Terry Runte. And it has all kinds of stuff. The seven-page pitch for Super Mario Brothers is there, along with articles Terry wrote for Omni Magazine and all kinds of other cool information. If you're looking for more on this story or on Terry, this is a good place to start. And you can find it at terryrunte.com, R-U-N-T-E. He really desperately did not want to be remembered as just the guy who loved Super Mario Brothers. It was like, 
you know, he was, that's why he went to Jamaica. He like, he was specifically trying to make the next movie that would, would lift him out of that pigeonhole. And, you know, it didn't work out. And, you know, and it, it was possible. Like Ed Solomon went on and had a great career. So, you know, it was, it was possible. We just wasn't possible, I guess, for us. And mostly that was because Terry got murdered. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Industry, presented by Movie Maker. Visit MovieMaker.com for more great podcasts, articles, and information about movies. If you love movies, want to make them, or you're a movie maker yourself, there's something for you at MovieMaker.com. And there's also a great newsletter that you can sign up for. Really, it's actually great. This episode was written, edited, and hosted by me, Dan Delgado. Special thanks to my guest this week, screenwriter Parker Bennett, and from the Super Mario Brothers archive, Ryan Haas and Stephen Applebaum. Music in this episode is from Epidemic Sound. Links to all sources used for this episode, the Super Mario archive, Terry Runte's archive, and anything else that I could think is relevant can be found at my website, industrypodcast.org. While you're there, you can leave me a voice message, which may or may not be used in an episode, and if you're so inclined, you can even buy me a coffee, which, to be honest, I would likely use to actually buy coffee. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or wherever you can leave a review. Have you tried Good Pods yet? It's a great app for finding new shows. Leaving a review may or may not help, but it will probably make me feel pretty good. If you'd like to contact me, you can. You can email me. It's dan at moviemaker.com. And I'm also on Twitter at TheIndustry13, Instagram at Industry underscore podcast, and Facebook at TheIndustryPod. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back again soon with another story of the things that went on in the industry. Be good. Be good.